Good morning, everybody. Jean Anderson speaking. Looking forward to actually seeing that to you in church and also being with you all at the next Saturday coffee morning. Till then, stay safe. Morning, everyone. It's Helen. I'm up at the food bank this morning. Missing seeing you all on a Sunday. Look after yourselves and take care, and hopefully, we'll see each other again soon. Take care. Bye. Hello, my name's Gordon Palmer. Welcome to our service here for uh, Claremont Parish Church for Sunday the 20th of September. Uh, as well as myself taking part in the service, Leslie Gold will be reading the scriptures for us and Lorna Kirk will be leading us in our prayers for others. Jesus, um, with a couple of his followers, Peter, with three, Peter, James and John went up the mount that became known as the Mount of Transfiguration. And while Jesus had been speaking uh, with the, the Lord and while Peter had been observing what was going on, um, <clears throat> we're told this. While Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the clouds said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Let us pray and we will gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer, the form of the Lord's Prayer that we use, that words will be on the screen. Let us pray. Lord, as we worship you, we worship you for the greatness of your salvation. How you're a God who in your grace turns waste to usefulness, pain to joy, dullness of, to light. We thank you how in Jesus you came into our world and how through Jesus you were involved in transforming our world. Through the pain of labor came the birth of a savior. Through the pain of living under oppression came the bringing in of the kingdom of God. Through the pain of identifying with us and all of our sinfulness came you being a saviour for us, a saviour who saves sinners. Through the pain of being rejected and despised came the victory of resurrection. In Christ you came. In Christ you transformed, in Christ you overcame. And we thank you for the wonder and the glory of Jesus being among us, Jesus being one of us. And yet also Jesus bringing the light and the love and the glory of God into everyday life. And Jesus, you are provide us with a saviour, but also a representative, one who might gather us up, one who might lead us into your holy presence. One who combines meekness and majesty, one who combines humanity and God. And Lord, you did that for us, so that there might be God with us, God among us, God for us, so that there might be salvation and renewal of life. And we thank you for that. Lord, we celebrate and give thanks for your coming. And we hear your words of call and invitation. But so often we find ways in our daily lives of keeping you at arm's length. Sometimes we find ways of rebelling against that fact that you don't come, yes, you come to us as one of us, but not just in our terms to do as, our, as we please. And so we push you away. Forgive us. Forgive us for the times when we've not wanted to hear your challenge, not accepted whom you have chosen, 
not allowed or tried to keep you out of the private areas of our lives. Forgive us for the time when we've not acknowledged that your rule doesn't necessarily mean that we can do as what we like. Forgive us. Forgive us when so readily we say, come and yet keep you away. Forgive us when we so readily say, come and yet make no provision, no effort to make you welcome. Forgive us when we say, come, but have no intention of letting our lives be changed. Lord God, help us to say, come, and mean it, and live it. And so gracious and merciful God, walk with us, not just through this time of a service, but also beyond as we seek to follow you in the world today. May our prayers and praising, may the Word of God come alive for us, that we might be built up and strengthened and better enabled to follow our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray and in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory of yours, now and forever. Amen.
was speaking to uh, folks of uh, Claremont, there's a couple of questions that are more commonly asked. One of them is about how, how's our granddaughter, how's we Anna getting on? And that's nice that you're asking, and she's getting on just great. But of course, the other question is, when do you think we'll be back in church? Now, I know what folks mean, and I know what you're asking and why you're asking it, and, and I too miss meeting together in the ways that we once did before March. I understand that folks want to be back, and especially that we miss seeing one another. But not just here, but elsewhere, there's been a lot of discussion about whether we can be back and be back safely. And a lot of my colleagues I know have been having these discussions. And it's clearly a big deal about when we can gather together in a big building for a service as we've done for years. But it doesn't mean that church has not been happening or that church is suspended. When Jesus commissioned his followers to take his mission, and we looked at that a couple of weeks ago, when he, to take his mission into the world, he did not focus on being able to have big meetings and big buildings and certain kinds of services and organization. He asked disciples to make disciples who would make disciples. And that was what the church did, and the church grew. In time, the church became top dog and in conjunction with the state. And for example, well, this year is the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower sailing across the Atlantic and settling in what we now call the United States of America. And the people who made that journey were doing so to get away, in a sense, from the established religion, not because they didn't believe in Jesus. They were followers of Jesus, but because of the way the established church was doing things. For example, you could be fined one shilling. Do you remember shillings? You could be fined one shilling um, if you didn't go to a Church of England service on Sunday. And one shilling and 400 years ago is about 20 pounds today. Now, what does that say? Well, one thing it says is the key thing is that you turn up at a big building set apart specially for services to, to be part of something for a limited time. And as long as you do that, that's fine. Now, I don't suppose any of us would want to go back to the time when you were fining people for not turning up. But the legacy that has stayed with us, nevertheless, is that that's what church is, the turning up at the, the big event. And that might not be what Jesus said. It's still important, yes, that we have ways of gathering together, and the New Testament makes clear that you, you cannot be a follower of Jesus all by yourself. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and not love the body of Christ. But the New Testament doesn't say what kind of gathering or how, for how long we gather or, or anything of like that, and, and even doesn't tell us very much about what has to happen when the believers gather. And yet we have made that, or our notions about that gathering, to be the be-all and the end-all. So when we've not been having the meeting like that, that becomes the dominant issue. But if a church has been doing not very much or nothing at all about disciple making, well, we don't notice that the same way, do we? Church of Scotland has congregations where nobody has joined by profession of faith for a decade and more. Church of Scotland has whole presbyteries where in some years nobody at all has joined by profession of faith. Now, I know that Joining a church organization by profession of faith is not the same thing as becoming a disciple. But there is an overlap, and it is the best measurement we, we have. Except we don't bother with it. We don't bother about it in anything like the same way we do when we're not open on Sunday mornings. Nobody's been joining, nobody comments, we've not been meeting, everyone says, when are we getting back? So here is the question. Here is the question that I think that current pandemic has show, th thrown into sharp focus for us. 
why do we suppose that having our own meeting is the most important thing? Jesus focused on disciple making. Jesus called into being disciples who would go on making disciples. He didn't give a blueprint for an organization in his name. So why is the church today not more concerned about disciple making? Now, this disciple-making mission is not something that's optional for church. It flows right out of the nature, of the loving nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And making disciples and the fulfill, is the fulfilling of the promise and the call of God. It is His loving work in the world. And so I'm taking a few Sundays to underline the source of, and the basis of that mission— it's right in the loving heart of God himself. Last week, we looked at the call of Abraham. The, just when things seemed to be so bleak and, and tapering down and fizzling out and barrenness, God stepped in. God called Abraham and said that he was going to be through his seed a blessing to nations. God was reaching out in love and was going to fulfill his purposes to bless. And now looking, as we were doing in some, a couple of New Testament passages, is how God the Son, how Jesus himself went about things when he came to us. Last week with Abraham, I pointed out that he had a context that he, from which he began. We all do living in this world. And so too did Jesus. And we're going to look at something of that context and the way that that shaped his mission in the story of Jesus' baptism, which we're now going to be here, here read from Mark's Gospel. Good morning. The first reading this morning is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. After Genesis chapter 12, the rest of what we now know as the Old Testament was a story of how Abraham's people became the nation of Israel, how they did and did not follow the call of God to be his faithful people. It's a story of how through their ups and, to be honest, mostly downs, the promise emerged of a Messiah who would come and be faithful in the way that Israel had been unfaithful. The Messiah would come who would move on the salvation, the promised fulfillment that God made to Abraham. Now in Mark chapter 1 at verse 9, the Messiah steps into public view. Jesus affirmed the ministry of John the Baptist, whose ministry was the, the last really in the line of these prophets that God had sent through the time of the Old Testament. Jesus took up and continued that work building on it. Jesus identified with the sinners of the world as he was being baptized by John. But as well as this identification with us and our sin, the baptism of Jesus also marked him out as someone special. A voice came from heaven, verse 11, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And these 
That, that voice, what it spoke, was an echo of two Old Testament passages. The first from Psalm 2, which spoke of the Messiah's reign and his kingship that would reach out through all the earth. And the second text in Isaiah chapter 42, at verse 1, which spoke of the Messiah coming to be a suffering servant. And these two things held together throughout the rest of the gospel. Jesus as son, Jesus as suffering servant. His message, verse 15, was that the kingdom of God has come near. And that too was rich in echoes of the faith of Israel. That God, the rightful king of all the world, wasn't acknowledged as such by all the world, but one day that promise given to Abraham would find its greater fulfillment and ultimately the perfect fulfillment when the kingdom would be here in all its fullness and God would be given the place and the reign that was his. And so Jesus' declaration, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, was not just a statement of truth, but also a statement of future hope. It was saying God is taking control, and God is doing so through the message and mission of Jesus, the Messiah. The promise to bless nations through the seed of Abraham is being all the more fully realized through this Messiah's coming. Here is the God's rule breaking in, and now is the time to respond. So Jesus says, repent, verse 15, and believe the good news. And it's in the reality of that, the rule of God, the loving kingship of God, that Jesus, at the end of the gospel, sent his followers out into the world just as he himself had been sent. You see, it's all flowing from the mission heart of God, God the Father and now God the Son, doing that sending, that reaching out, that longing to bless. Now, of course, there are many different ways in which a mission like that might have been carried out, different aspirations, different motivations for it. And today, our second reading, this time from Matthew's Gospel, gives clear insight about the spirit or the manner or the way in which Jesus was exercising that ministry, that Jesus was taking that mission further in the plans and in the purposes of God. Listen for the word of God. The second reading this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, entitled, the workers are few. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, te preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Amen. In Matthew chapters 8 and 9, Jesus has a series of encounters. A man with leprosy, a centurion whose servant is ill, Peter's fevered mother-in-law, the disciples in a boat during a storm, demon-possessed men, a paralyzed man. Matthew himself, a, a despised tax collector, a bereaved ruler, an ill woman, blind men, another mute man. And then we get the summary in verses 35 to 38 of Matthew 9. That verse 35 is a kind of gathering up of these threads, a pulling things together, some kind of summary statement is made all the more clear to us in the fact that the words of Matthew verse 30, uh, 935 are almost identical to chapter 4 verse 23. In chapter 4, 23, we have something of a programmatic statement of this is who the Messiah is, this is what the Messiah is going to be doing. And then in 935, using almost exactly the same words, it says this is what the Messiah has been doing, this is what we've just been describing. And verse 36 tells us that the motivation for that was really in the love 
and the compassion of God. When Jesus, verse 36, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. They were like a sheep without shepherd. They were a people who were harassed and helpless. And they were left without hope and what God's promises and God's provisions for them actually was. Instead of the Pharisees showing and explaining to the people, they had got caught up with their own religious systems and their traditions and their styles and their ways and practices mattered more than the showing and sharing God's love. But Jesus believed that the heart of the people could still be one. Verse 37. The harvest is plentiful. People were still open to the good news. People were still be open to following one who was a true leader. People were ready to acknowledge the rightful king if he could be shown to them. And so Jesus asks, verse 38, for his followers to pray that God would send laborers into this harvest. And then in chapter 10, he sends out the 12 disciples, partly as an answer to their own prayers. And so the mission of Jesus becomes the mission of the disciples, and later on then becomes the mission of the church. And it's a mission that flows out of love and compassion. And this remains the basis for our having a mission, for our having good news. Jesus is king and his kingdom is breaking into the world. The king is coming again. And the mission of Jesus, chapter 9, the mission of the disciples, chapter then, and then that given to the followers, the church, is always to be rooted in compassion. It is one thing for a teacher to come proclaiming some new way to live, but it's another when the king of kings in compassion draws alongside when the King of Kings in compassion is, uh, shares our baptism for the repentance of sins. It's another thing when the King of Kings comes alongside to serve, not to be served, and to bless others. And that is Jesus' way. The Creator becomes a creature, becomes a servant. Now, Jesus looked then at the people, verses 35 to 38 of Matthew 9. Jesus looked at the people, and they were the kind of people he was meeting throughout chapters 8 and chapter 9, and saw them not only like a sheep without a shepherd, but also, changing the farming imagery, he saw them like a full wheat, a field full of wheat, but nobody to harvest it. They were ready for God's kingdom but didn't know where to look to find it. They were ready for God to act, but who was going to tell them that God was already in action? God has moved. And what Jesus had been doing in the previous two chapters on his own authority was now at his command to be handed to his followers, verse, uh, chapter 10, and then ultimately in chapter 28 at the end of Matthew's Gospel. That going, that serving, that caring, that blessing, that having compassion, that reaching out, that ministering in both word and action, that sharing of the good news that was Jesus' work is passed to the disciples and then on to his church. Now that work is not to be summed up in our having meetings. That, that work is not fulfilled simply by our gathering together. Now, the church being called to meet together is significant and important. But to see it as the end in itself is to make the very mistake that the Pharisees and so on were making in Jesus' time, confusing their religion, devout and sincere as it was in the Pharisees' case, confusing that with the mission of God. It wasn't about religious observance in the first instance, so much as about faithfulness to God and his work, his mission in the world. Now again, I'm not saying that God has sent this time of a pandemic in order to teach the church, but I am saying that in this time, 
There is a big lesson for us to learn and to reflect on what is absolutely key in fulfilling Jesus' mission. What is absolutely essential in fulfilling the Father's purposes? Whether or not that matches up to your preferences and to my preferences is of little importance. It's not our church, it's Jesus' church. And it's not our mission. We are not the King of Kings. He is. And so that emphasis that he put and he placed on disciples making disciples is far more important than simply being able to gather together or how many gather together. And yet all this fuss that we make about meeting together, important as it is, and all the little fuss that we make when so few in our day and time come to faith and begin to follow Jesus, that shows that we've got it wrong. That our priorities are not his priorities. That we've focused too much on, on ourselves and not enough on his work and his mission in the world. What and how do we show and do we share God's loving purposes in the world today? Mission not because we have to, mission but not because we need a recruitment drive, but mission because this is what is in the heart of God the Father. This is what is in the heart of God the Son. And this is what they have passed on to us. Let us pray. Lord, these are big times. These are confusing times. These are changing and transforming times through which we're living. And yet how we love to cling to the faithful, how long we love to say, let's get back to normal. But Lord, may we not so much seek our understanding or our imagination of what is normal so much as we seek faithfulness to you, so much as we seek listening to the call of God and following the call of God for your glory. Amen. Jesus, verse 36 of Matthew 9, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Compassion for the kind of people he'd been meeting in chapter 8 and chapter 9 of Matthew's gospel. And we sing of meeting with those and that kind of need. In our next hymn, Christ is the world in which we move. After we've sung this hymn, we'll confess our faith together in the Apostles' Creed. And afterwards, Lorna Kirk will be leading us in our prayers for others. And then we conclude our service by a hymn that emphasizes just how fully Jesus came among us and, and reached out to us. My Lord, you wore no royal crown. But firstly, Christ is a world in which we move.
I believe in God. God, in this uncertain time, we continue to lift up to you as affected directly by ill health in the time of coronavirus. We also pray, Lord, for people whose mental health is being affected. It's been a very difficult six months for many people, economically, and um, dealing with changing family circumstances and uncertainty in their jobs, uncertainty with their housing, and Lord, even just not being able to socialise and spend time as part of a community. We just lift these people up to you, Lord, that you would draw alongside them so that they understand that they're not alone. And Lord, we ask that you would soften our hearts and help us as your community here on earth, that we might support and uplift those who feel isolated and who feel alone. Lord, call them to mind for us that we might minister into that loneliness. Lord, we also pray for um, people across the globe who are being affected by all sorts of uh, severe weather conditions. Um, there seem to be storms and floods and fires raging as far as the eye can see. And while this week we've enjoyed a couple of more um, temperate and unexpected days here, um, we know that that too might be a symptom of global climate change. Lord, we just ask that you would keep it in our hearts um, to be going forward and creating positive change. Um, that we might remember that um, the planet is a shared resource and it's a shared space. Um, and it's your gift to us, Lord. We just would like to take better care of it. Help us to know and understand better how we can each do that. Lord, we also want to lift up our own church community in this time. We know that as term has returned, there are many organisations who would normally be meeting to support people and encourage and engage and uplift people and create outlets for their skills and, and for their passions. And um, while the building is not usable for those purposes, Lord, I just ask that you would support um, your community here and inspire them to find new and ingenious ways um, to continue those good works that people might still see um, the light that you give us shining in this community and in this place. In that time also we want to pray for um, people in leadership, in leadership in our country, in leadership in our community, in leadership in our schools and businesses across the nation. There are many people who haven't had any respite over the summer, who haven't had the opportunity of a break or a change of scenery. And it's so difficult to keep making good decisions when you're exhausted. Lord, help us to remember those people. Help us to um, support people who are in leadership over us. Um, in prayer and in practical ways. We are thankful that you promise that you are with us in this time, always and to the end of the age. We know that when we pray these things, that you can hear us. And in your name we pray. Amen. 